This video is sponsored by Hero Forge and is all about their advanced posing tools and how you can use them to tweak the standard poses to give your character personality, create a sense of motion, and even tell a little bit of a story with the scene. So let's get right into it. Activate intro! <laughs> Hey, my name is Jonathan, also known as The Mad Maker, also known as the producer of the Mercs of Mischief Twitch channel, where we play tabletop RPGs, and also then we put them over here on YouTube. Now by this point, I've got quite a bit of experience with the Hero Forge uh, tools under my belt, and I've also picked up a lot of really great tips from the Hero Forge Creators Guild Facebook group. But when you first pop open the advanced posing tools, it can be a little bit intimidating. There are a whole lot of sliders in there, and you don't exactly know what they all do until you play with them for a bit. So I thought I'd make a video explaining the advanced posing tools, showing what all the different options do, and sparing you the learning curve that I had to go through before being able to really get what I wanted out of my poses. All right, so if you've been in the Hero Forge interface before, you've probably seen the posing area, but just in case you haven't, there's basically two main sections of the tabs up here. There's first the character posing, and then the advanced posing. We're gonna be focusing on the options in the advanced posing today, but to start off, we're gonna talk about the character poses because this is actually the important first step in any advanced posing. To demonstrate some of this, we are going to take a look at our friend and cleric, Jilbetta. She's a nice, simple, basic humanoid, bipedal model. This way we can really get a look at what the different base poses are gonna do. The reason this is important is because in advanced posing, you don't get to change anything about the character from the torso down. You'll notice we've got torso, arms, head, hair items, but no legs pose. They wanna make sure that anything you make here in the Hero Forge interface is going to be able to one, print on uh, either your 3D printer at home or the 3D printers over at Shapeways who fulfill their orders. And two, they wanna make sure it's not gonna just fall over. So if you're planning on doing some advanced posing, when you're looking at all of the options here, really just focus on the legs. Now, if you've already done some advanced posing, and then you go to click on this, you'll see this pop up. And this is why you want to do this first, because as soon as I click this button to change the position of the legs, all of my work is gone. So if you're not sure if you wanna change it, make sure that you've saved your current work before you click accept. And we can see that actually this one looks pretty cool. Uh, there's a couple other new poses. <laughs> this definitely fits her character. Like, what did you just say to me? Facial expressions are a different element of character design that I think I'll cover in a future video. Um, maybe when some more features like uh, tattoo decals and stuff drop. Now I'll also say that at this early stage, if you know you're going to have an animal companion on your base, now is the time to place them there and consider that when choosing your base pose. As we can demonstrate with our penguin friend here, the animal companion's pose will change depending upon the base character pose that you choose for your character. It's so cute! And the same of course goes for other animal companions that sit on your base. So you wanna make sure you got that on there before you do your posing. Now Jobetta usually only pulls her shield out when she's ready for a fight. So we're gonna assume that we need her in kind of a wider stance or in an action pose. So once we've chosen where we wanna start, then it's time to move on to the advanced posing option. Now, when you first click in, it can be a little intimidating looking at all the sliders and trying to figure out exactly what they're all gonna do. But once you understand all of these different points of articulation, it's actually pretty easy to get it exactly where you wanna go. Now, I think to really uh, be able to take a good look at what each of these points of articulation are gonna do, we should move over to our friend, Lenny. We're gonna strip off his clothing and get his items out of the way so that for right now, we can just look at the bare bones, if you will of what the different sliders are positioning. We'll start from a nice neutral pose and take a look at our options. So I think the first thing to look at is the torso and seeing how many points of articulation there are, which is three. Now, if you click on this little symbol right here, it will pull up a handle on that point of articulation and it allows you to see exactly where it is. That one, as opposed to this one, which is a little bit higher up and the third one, which is higher up still. Now I have an idea of what sort of options I have when positioning the overall upper body of the character. 
The neck is basically just kind of skipping the chest area and going up the spine. So again, you have three points of articulation that you can move back and forth with either the handles or the sliders. In the measurement section of the body tab here, there is a slider for posture. And this is probably something you messed with while you were uh, creating the character, hopefully. But it's important to note that this can affect the overall positioning of the spine. So keep in mind that you have this option as well to kind of affect the pose. Now, the other thing we have that we can control on the upper body is the arms. Arms on humanoids and most animals with limbs tend to have three main points of articulation, and that is the shoulders, the elbows, and the wrists. The shoulders and elbows are controlled by this upper arm portion. The lower arm portion here is just the wrist. You can see that with the upper arm, we have three different sections, the shoulder, the elbow, and the clavicle. The elbow only has one slider. You can end up in certain situations where the arms are kind of contorted, everything else is twisted around, and the elbow moves in a direction that you don't immediately expect by looking at it. But when you're looking at the skeleton version, you can pretty easily see that, yeah, it moves like an elbow is supposed to. So underneath these three sections, you have the other sliders. So with the shoulder, you got the twist. And if you want to get a feel for, you know, what this is gonna do, practice with your own body. Stick out your arm and rotate your shoulder. You'll probably find that when you move your arm, your shoulder doesn't twist quite this far you actually end up twisting other parts of your arm in an effort to recreate this palm down, palm up situation. At least that's what it seems like to me. If you're an anatomy expert, uh, let me know in the comments what is wrong about what I'm saying there. But we're focusing on Hero Forge, not human beings. And not everything you create in Hero Forge is a human being and limited to our anatomy. In fact, at the time of this recording, they have 38 different fantasy races to choose from. That's right, this video is sponsored by Hero Forge, and they want you to know that you can mix and match all their different fantasy races along with thousands of different items for any of this posing that you're looking to do. So you can do like a skeleton body with robot legs and a bird head, which we totally did. And it turned out to be like my new favorite character. It makes it easy to create your perfect custom mini. Check out the links in the description. And since this entire video is about Hero Forge, let's just get back into it. The other options you have are bend, which is basically your in and out. So sort of scooping things in or pushing them away. And then tilt, which is your up and down. Hi! We also have the clavicle. Now the clavicle is probably a part of our body that we don't really think about. So when it comes to posing, I like to think of it as basically extra range to add to the shoulder. You can see that the motion I get when I move tilt on the shoulder is sort of an up and down thing and there are limitations on the range. If I come down to clavicle, it pushes that just a little further. If this wasn't a skeleton, all you would really notice is the position of the arm moving there. So sometimes when you're trying to get an arm just right and it feels like you can't, move back to the clavicle to really just adjust the central point where it's attaching to the torso. Then of course, with the wrist, you can twist it, which is pretty self-explanatory, bend it, which is kind of your back and forth, like you're shaking hands, or tilt, which is more like you're waving. And here's where I think uh, I'll say a few things about sliders versus handles. You may have noticed I'm kind of interchangeably using both, and I tend to do that while I'm designing. I find that sliders are a little bit easier, but usually when I'm jumping to a slider, I will wiggle it a little bit to get an idea of what direction it's controlling, because I don't always remember all this stuff off the top of my head. And depending on what other posing you've done before that, things like rotating the shoulder will kind of affect the end result. Handles can be a little bit quicker but it's easier to kind of get lost in unnatural positions when that's not your intention. So I generally say start with sliders, but if I'm having trouble getting the exact combination to create the position that I want, I will uh, then usually jump into handles and just drag it where I need it to go. Then depending on the situation, maybe pop back in to fine tune with the sliders once again. This brings me to discussion of items. I know I'm beating this one to death, but nobody's got more items than pen, right? So let's look at how they interact. Now at this time, side items are pretty much just bolted into place, but one of the Kickstarter stretch goals that they met was to make uh, more hand items available as side items and to make them posable. 
so you can kind of control the orientation on the sides. When that happens, we'll probably make another video, but for now, let's go to the hand items and talk about them first. Now, exactly what you get to do with each item depends on what it is. So, for example, you'll notice we don't have any option to position the book. The book is pretty much just welded to the hand. If you want an open book, there are other items for that. But if you want to change the position of an item that doesn't have a posing option, that's where you go to the wrist. And though we can't change the connection between the book and the hand, we can change the position of the wrist to put the item in an overall different position. With spell effects, you get some options similar to that which you do with the wrist itself. So it's almost like just creating another point of articulation from there. Twist is just gonna spin the thing around. Bend will rotate it in one direction around your palm and Tilt will rotate it in the other. And if you can't remember which is which, just grab that there handle and put it wherever you need it to go. I like to imagine this is Penn having a conversation. Ah, oh, why didn't we think of this before we printed it? This is so much better. This is so good. Ah, oh, Skylar, why didn't we think of this? It's also funny because his character's backstory has developed into more or less being Hamlet. Now if we look at other items we can put in the hand, like pole arms or swords, we have different options. With a blade, you basically just get to choose the rotation of the grip, and you also have a button to reverse it if, for whatever reason, you want to do that underhanded thing that they do in the movies sometimes. He doesn't know how to use a sword, he's just defending his cat as best he can. With something longer, like a pole arm of some sort, a spear perhaps, you get both the twist and the grip position to decide where on the object they are holding it. Which I think is important because if they're just like standing at attention, a spear might be on the ground pointing up. If they are brandishing it, they might be holding it more in the center. Now if you go two-handed, you probably should have decided that before you started posing here, but you're back to only being able to choose the twist and if you want to reverse which end the pointy side is on. If you have an item attached to the back, you can twist it just basically at the point where it connects. And this is important to take into consideration when you're thinking about painting your mini. I'm actually gonna make a full video about that. That should be out next week. But just for example, Lucas originally had his axe positioned straight up and down, which while probably would make more sense for actually carrying it because the weight's more evenly distributed, would make it so incredibly difficult to paint the back of his helmet. So we gave it a twist to the side to get it out of the way to make sure that we can get all those surfaces with the brush. Another thing to note is that if you do have two back items, the one that attaches first will affect the one that attaches second. Because see, the point of contact for the ice staff here is on the cape, on the model's back. But the point of contact for his healing staff is on the ice staff. In reality, if they were bundled together a bit more, this would have been a much easier mini to print. Having them kind of pointing in the same direction there uh, fulfills a lot more of my tips for making your minis easier to print at home. Check out that video. It's also worth noting, again, that this ice staff attaches to the cape, not to the character's back. If he didn't have a cape, then it would attach to his back. But since he does have a cape, we've got to take that into consideration too. Now capes have seven points of articulation, but you're only really gonna to get to use all of them if you have one of these longer capes. Once again, to see where they are, we can just click on the various handles and you'll notice that it's essentially running down the center. That's where the sort of skeletal structure of the cape exists. You get three sliders on each point of articulation, uh, just like with a lot of the different points of articulation. The twist, the bend, and the tilt. Now, similar to capes are hair, and to a slightly lesser extent, wings. Wings really just have the shape they have, and you can control at the point of attachment, but you can position them independently, and so there's some opportunity to create motion there. But really, if you want to depict a character in motion, hair and capes are the best for doing that. So let's say in this scenario, Rolda was quickly spinning around to her left. Maybe she's waving this thing around and somebody's like, Rolda, be careful with that. What? No, it's fine. So we can create some of that sense of motion with a tail too. If you're using something like a horse tail, that would be kind of uh, subject to the physics of hair. But think about when you wave a cloth around or if you or someone you know has who has long hair 
turns their head quickly. The part that's attached is going to move the quickest and the tips are gonna trail behind. We'll just pop her wings out for now so we can get a better look. But if she was turning to her left, we would expect the cape to be sort of trailing behind that turn. Now our sort of left-right control is the bend. So I'll start by going through and adjusting each of the points of articulation just a little bit to create a nice fluid motion. Rookie mistake a lot of people make is by going either right to the top and trying to control the position of the cape only with that one or by going somewhere in the middle and just uh, doing it there. But you can end up with kind of unnatural positioning that doesn't really capture that motion and flow that you get if you do more of a kind of a gradual situation where each point moves a little bit. Also think about if you spin around with a cape or a dress, how it sort of pulls out with that centrifugal centrifugal motion. That's the right one, right? That's the one that pulls stuff out. To get that effect, I would uh, add some tilt and starting with a little bit right where it attaches and then gradually becoming more and more as we get towards the bottom. And then obviously to complete the look, I wanna do the same thing with the hair. Think about the fact that her head is twisted further so they're not gonna be completely in line but I'll add little bits of bend through each of the points of articulation, which in this case, there are eight, but the last one only affects the very little tip of this hairstyle. In this eighth one, we've just barely made it on the attachment point. I'll also then come back and add some tilt, once again, starting with less and gradually increasing as we get to the end of the hair here. And here's where I noticed that there's a little bit of some conflict going on here. We've got the cape clipping through the hair. This is something a lot easier to see when you have them in color. Honestly, if I'm not gonna have this printed in color, that wouldn't even be noticeable, but it is a good signal that something about the interaction of these two objects or parts of the miniature aren't quite natural. And so this is where I'm gonna look at the twist and see that, oh yeah, you know what? If it was originally laying on top of the cape and then she moved real fast, there'd probably be a little bit of twist there. Now compared to where I started, this character has a whole lot more motion and I think is just a whole lot more generally interesting. And when I put my wings back on, I have some decisions to make about how exactly those are going to sit. With wings, again, you get a twist, a bend, and a tilt. This is one of those cases where I say it's just best to kind of play around with it. And then once you get one part in place like a wing, you may find that it makes more sense to adjust something else like your cape so as not to conflict. You also wanna be careful about layers intersecting each other. The short answer is that you kind of want them to. That way they print as one big solid chunk and you don't have a bunch of little spots that have to be supported in between or places where you've got to squeeze your paintbrush in. Again, check out my other design tips videos for more details on that. Now, another thing that's very, very interesting, very interesting options uh, here in this setup, especially when it comes to items, is the tail. Some tails can hold items, some can't. But on full-size tails, there are 16 points of articulation and all of them will affect some point on the tail. The items connect at point 14. So basically, whether or not you can use an item with that tail has to do with whether or not it reaches that 14th point. Now I could seriously spend an entire video on just positioning tails and I might do that at some point because you can do some wild stuff. A lot of it having to do with actually hiding the tail inside of the body to create a situation where items are either attached to or protruding from the body in ways differently than originally intended. Ah! So if you want to see that or, you know, if you have any specific suggestions for videos that you'd like to see tips on, you know, let me know in the comments. Maybe just generally a tails, horns, and wings one because there's a lot of options too with the way you position horns. You can position them together separately um, and you can really get a lot of character and sort of creature uh, detail out of the way you position those. So yeah, probably goes in another video. Last thing I'm gonna talk about here is base items. Um, the posing options there are pretty much just positioning. I did mention earlier about how animal companions on your base will be affected by your base pose and sort of take on different postures depending on what you choose there. But you can still control the position on the base. Because the base itself is a two-dimensional space, this is kind of the easiest part to conceive of. You've got forwards and backwards, uh, left to right and a rotation. So, you know, basically an X axis, a Y axis and a twist. Um, if you choose base items that have multiple items, 
you'll find that for each item, you can control them individually, which is a lot of fun. A lot of people think of base items as just sort of atmospheric pieces to add to the feel, but if you stop to think about it, you can actually create a scene using a base item and some creative posing. Now, instead of being attacked by an evil monster box, he's feeding it. It's his pet. He loves him. Hello, Bobby. This is my friend Bobby the Box. He likes cupcakes. Who's a good boy? Who wants a cupcake? Yes, you are. You are. Bobby's a good boy. But let's be honest, an evil box probably wouldn't make a good friend, even for a goblin. That's a much more likely outcome. Don't be afraid to get creative with the interactions and play around with things. You know, something like a broom can be a sweeping tool or a vehicle if you position it right. That's all I got for you today. I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any questions, post them down in the comments. Please, if you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel because I'm gonna be doing more videos like this. Let me know in the comments if there's any specific topics you want covered, whether that be specific posing like those cool tail tricks or really anything else about Hero Forge. Kinda know some people over there might be able to answer some questions. Be sure to check us out on Twitch, playing live every Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So until next time, keep on miniaturing. That's nothing. That's not a...